Hey, what's up, young adults? Uh, it's so good to be back with you today as we're continuing our series, Are You Saved? My name is Alex. I get to serve as one of the campus pastors here at Christ Fellowship. And we are in a series right now, right in the middle of a series, where we're talking about what happens at the moment of salvation and what the process of becoming more like Christ looks like. And as we dive into these, I'm confident that God is going to give you not only assurance, but God is going to give you clarity on what it looks like to be a child of God and the work that he's doing in your life. Amen. And so I want to start today by reading Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 11. This is what God's word says. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he, that's Christ, has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Before we start, let's pray. God, we thank you so much for your word. And we thank you for the work that you do in those who place their faith in Jesus. God, as we dive into your word today, help us to understand the work that you're doing in our life. God, help us to understand what it means to be saved. And God, help us have clarity on what our lives should look like after salvation. God, I thank you for every young adult that's watching, whether it be online or in person. God, I pray that you would bless them and the family that they represent. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, you know, I wanna to start today with a little story about a town in Italy called Florence. In the 1500s, a famous cathedral wanted to create a series of sculptures that would honor God and impress people. And so they commissioned an artist to choose a stone to work on to create a beautiful sculpture. This artist that was commissioned went, traveled to go find the right marble slab and he picked out this giant marble slab and went through the process of having it moved to Florence, Italy, where he would begin working on this slab. After a little while, the artist realized that the slab that he picked, really he felt that it was unusable. As he's trying to chisel and as he's trying to carve, really he begins to find too many imperfections in the rock and he even sees some veins of cracking that was happening and he deems that this marble slab was unfit to be used for art. So as he gives up, then the cathedral says, hey, we still have this project to do and they commission another artist. And this other artist, his hopeful comes in, begins to work on the marble slab, but sooner or later he discovers that he feels that this marble slab was unworkable and it was unfit to be used for art. He could not see a potential for this marble slab. But that's when a young artist that we all know as Michelangelo came on the scene. And when he saw the marble slab, he felt that there was potential and that something great was hiding inside. So he began, he accepted the contract to begin the work and he faced criticism because two well-known artists had already given up on this marble slab. And they felt that there was no way that a work can be done on this marble slab. You know, that brings me over to our, our main idea for tonight. Because for many of us, we, we come to know Jesus. We, we, we accept him as our savior. We ask him to forgive us of our sins. And the Bible says that he gives us the Holy Spirit. But then there comes a season where we feel like God is not at work in our life, right? Where, where other people, they don't see God working. Uh, we, we feel that God is not working. We haven't changed to the degree that we feel that we should be changed as Christians. But let me tell you, write this down as our main point for tonight. We can be sure that God is doing a transforming work within us. Just like with Michelangelo, as everybody looked upon that rock, they felt that nothing could be done. People look at our lives at times and they feel that, are you really a Christian? Are you really saved? But I thank God that Michelangelo set an example for us in not giving up on the work that was to be done. Because many of you have probably seen this, but the statue that he made, the statue of David, which you can see now, it has been now known as one of the greatest works of art ever to hit uh, humanity, ever to be seen. And so in this, this statue, we see uh, just, just quality workmanship. And we see a really a, a beautiful example of what the human uh, mind can come up with and what the human hands can accomplish. But here's what we know. That before Michelangelo, that rock, that marble was deemed unusable. That it could never be art. When Michelangelo was asked, how did you create that? How did you know what could come? Michelangelo's words were this, I saw the angel and I freed it. See, he knew what was capable, what was possible with that marble slab. And I want you to know today that God knows. God is working in your life. 
And that process in which God works on us is called sanctification. And today that's what we're going to talk about. See, sanctification is, is something that's easily misunderstood. It's easily ignored and minimized in the life of a believer. But the truth is, sanctification is a central theme in the life of a believer, according to Scripture. And sanctification is not something that's even optional. No, it's, it's a natural outworking of the salvation uh, that has come upon us through Jesus and evidence of God's presence in our life. And so that begs the question, what work is God doing in my life, right? What, wasn't the work that God was doing completed on the cross according to Jesus? Well, today we're gonna answer these questions and, and we're gonna really take a look at, at the theological pillars of sanctification, namely, you know, how sanctification begins, the process of sanctification, and the purpose of sanctification. And so we're gonna unpack these points. So if you're taking notes, which you should be, I want you to write this down as point number one. Sanctification begins with grace. See, what we need to understand is that, that it begins with God's grace, that grace is a foundation of every aspect of the Christian life, including our growth in holiness, right? Otherwise known as sanctification. Ephesians chapter two, verse eight and nine says this. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. See, just as our justification that we talked about last week, right? The, the, the being declared righteous by God is, uh, is a gift of grace. Our sanctification or, or being made holy in practice uh, is also an act of grace. See, it, it starts with God's initiative, not ours. Many people try to force sanctification. They try to be perfect. And what we need to understand is that theologically we can see that God is the one who sanctifies us. And, and there's a couple layers of sanctification that I want to teach. So this, just, just take notes and hang on with me. The first one is this. There is uh, a, a theological um, the explanation of sanctification that's called positional sanctification or, or definitive sanctification. This is the idea that when we place our faith in Christ, we are positionally sanctified, meaning we're set apart where, where the word holy comes from in God's sight. And that is because of God's work on the cross. Hebrews 10.10 10, uh, teaches us, it says this, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. So the moment that we believe we are positionally set apart as holy, very similar to justification, but that positional sanctification is only the beginning. God doesn't leave us in that state of initial salvation, that there you are and that's it. No, instead he calls us into a process that's called progressive sanctification. It's that ongoing transformation in the work of a believer where the Holy Spirit conforms us into the image of Christ. And this, what I want you to understand is this is also rooted not in our own efforts, but in God's own grace. Philippians 1.6 puts it this way. He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. And so what does that mean? What does that imply? Well, that sanctification is God's gracious work from start all the way through finish. We didn't earn our salvation. And in the same way, we don't earn our sanctification. It's a gift from God. It's his grace. See, it doesn't happen because we deserve it. It doesn't happen because we work hard enough to be sanctified. It happens because God graciously chooses to change us. See, we have to understand that sanctification is not a test of spiritual merit. No, it's a testament to God's mercy. And our role isn't to strive for holiness out of fear of God, but really to rest in God's grace as he changes us from glory to glory and works to make us holy. See, that should free you from a performance-driven faith that, hey, I have to perform to please God. I have to just be good enough. No, no, no. Rest in the goodness of God and be dependent, not on your works, but on his grace. And so if God is the one who, who really carries through the work of sanctification, what role do we play? Are we just passive? Do we just watch God work? Well, write this down as number two. See, sanctification is a cooperative process. See, while it begins with God's initiative, it requires our participation. See, it's a cooperative process where God's power and our obedience work together hand in hand. And Paul highlights this in Philippians chapter two, verse 12 says this, therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, watch this part, he says this, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. 
For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. See, this passage reveals two truths about sanctification. The first one is that there is human responsibility. Paul calls believers to work out their salvation with fear and trembling. See, this doesn't mean that we work for our salvation. No, but that we work from our salvation. We work from, uh, we pursue holiness, we pursue righteousness in response to God's free gift of salvation. And it requires intentional effort. In 1 Peter chapter 1, you're not going to see this, but Peter calls us to be holy in all that you do. For it is written, be holy as, as I am holy. And holiness is a command from God, something that we have to take action on and obey and cooperate with. So not only is there human responsibility, but there is also divine empowerment in the process of sanctification. So even though we are strive to, 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 we're called to strive for holiness, it's crucial to remember that Paul says that it is God who works in you. See, we're not sanctified by our strength, but we're sanctified by God's spirit working in us. In Galatians chapter 5, 16, it says to, to walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. See, the spirit is the one that it helps us, empowers us to overcome sin and pursue godliness. But cooperative, right? We must choose to walk in step with him. And so sanctification really is this synergistic approach. It's this active cooperation with the Holy Spirit. And this really concept, it contrasts justification that we talked about last week because justification is monergistic. That means it is God alone who declares us righteous and just. But in sanctification, we're called to partner with God, responding to his grace with obedience and commitment. Uh, it's the idea really of rowing a boat down a stream. See, God is the current that takes you from point A to point B, from, from, from not sanctified to sanctified. It's God is the current. But we have a choice as we sit. We have a choice to go and row with the current or try to row against the current. But here's the good news. The current always wins. And so my encouragement, YA, is for us to row with the current, that, that for us to obey and follow God's power in our life so that we can work together in the process of sanctification with God. So how do we cooperate with that process of sanctification? Well, we practice our spiritual disciplines, right? It's not a passive experience, but it's an experience where we're not called to neglect our role, but to play a part in God's work in us. So to be sanctified, we have to be intentional. And you know what those things are that help you to walk with God and be sanctified. It's praying. It's reading your word. It's being involved in the local church. It's serving. And so these are all ways that God uses to grow us in our understanding of Christ, mature us to have a Christ-like mind, and ultimately transform us. But what's the purpose? What's the purpose of sanctification? I want you to write this down as number three. The purpose of sanctification, simply put, is to reflect Christ. See, sanctification is not about self-improvement. It's not about personal satisfaction. It's not just about, about having a more uh, fulfilling walk with God. No, the purpose of sanctification is to reflect Christ. Romans 8, 29 puts it this way. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. See, those God foreknew, he predestined to conform to the image of his son. That is God's goal for us, young adults. It's for us to conform to the image of Christ. That's, sanctification is the means in which we're shaped into looking like God, into behaving like Jesus, into reflecting Jesus to the world around us. And when we reflect Jesus to the world around us, we reflect his love and people come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. See, theologically, the concept is rooted in the idea of imago Dei, right? The idea that humans were created in the image of God. We, we see that from the beginning in Genesis, Genesis chapter one, where we see that God made us in his image to reflect his image to the world. But we know that sin marred this image. It distorted reality. It distorted the reflection of God's character in us. But the good news is this, that in Jesus, God's plan to, is to restore that image. And the process in which he does that 
is what we've been talking about all night. It is sanctification. It's the process that we are gradually restored to the image of Christ as perfectly revealed in Jesus. But why Jesus? Why is God conforming us to the image of Jesus? Why not himself? Well, Jesus is our ultimate standard of holiness. Jesus is, is God here on earth. And he calls us Christians to be imitators of Jesus, reflect the love of Jesus for a world that desperately needs him. See, Jesus is the perfect embodiment of obedience, of love, of humility, right? Of compassion. And so in the process of sanctification, our lives become more and more accurate as a reflection of Jesus Christ. Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians 3.18. God's word says this, and we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his what? His image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the spirit. See, sanctification is this spirit-led transformation, changing us into what? The image of Christ for the purpose of revealing his glory to others. Sanctification is so much more than just personal morality, just being a better person, just living a more godly life for the sake of having a good life. No, it's all about bearing witness to Jesus. See, if salvation for ourselves was the means to an end, if this is God's primary goal was just to save us and only us, well, then the moment at salvation, we would be taken up in glory to God. See, but when God saves us, he saves us and he blesses us so that we can be a blessing and so that we can share the love of Jesus with others. It's how God chooses to do evangelism. It's through believers in the local church. And so in a world marked with sin, right, marred by selfishness, a sanctified life really stands out as a powerful reminder that God is real and that he's working in the lives of people and that he has a plan for salvation. See, as we reflect God's character to others, Christ's character, we fulfill our purpose as what? Image bearers of Christ and we draw others to the beauty of the gospel. And so my question for you today, young adults, is do people see Christ in me? Am I reflecting Jesus's values? Am I reflecting Jesus's character, the beatitudes of Christ that he talks about? Am I reflecting the Holy Spirit's fruits so that people see that God is working in our life? Partner with God in the process of sanctification. Renounce sin, turn from sin, grow in virtue, care about the things that God cares about and live in a way that points others to Jesus. The truth is this, as we live our life as Christians, the world is watching and not just in person, they're watching our social media, they're watching our lives, they're watching the choices that we make. When people look at you, do they see somebody who's pointing to Jesus or as David was called, do they see a man or a woman after God's own heart? See, that's the greatest calling you have, young adult. Your greatest calling is to point people to Jesus and not just by the way that we speak, but really by our lives. I'll close with this. There's a famous story of a woman and her Bible study. They're gathering together and they're studying the book of Malachi. And as they're studying, in chapter three, they come across a verse, verse three, that says this, they read, he will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. And so the women, they thought about that for the moment. What does it mean that God will sit as a refiner, as a purifier of silver? How does that, how does that speak to the nature and the character of God? What does that have to do with, with us, they, they thought. And so one woman offered to find out more about the process of refining silver and that she would follow up with them the next time they meet the following week. So the following week, the woman calls up a silversmith and she makes an appointment to watch him while he is at work. She didn't mention anything about the reason for her interest, but beyond her curiosity to know the process of refining silver. And so the woman begins to watch the silversmith work. He, he works with intentionally, intentionality. He holds the piece of silver over the fire. He lets it heat up and, and he explains that, that as he's refining the, the, the silver in the fire that he needs to hold the spoon in, in the middle of the fire where the flames are the hottest. And she says, well, why do you have to do that? He says, well, it's to remove the impurities so that we're left with fine silver. 
She says, oh, is there a way that you could set it and you could walk away? The man says, no, no, actually, I need to watch it and have my eye on the silver the entire time because if we leave the silver in the fire too long, then the silver can be destroyed. And so she was silent for a moment and she was pondering all that he said and she's watching. And then she asks this question. She says to the silversmith, okay, but how do you know when the silver is fully refined? And, and the silversmith smiles at the woman and he says to her this, Oh, that's easy. It's when I can see my image in the silver. Young adults know this. That story is, is a perfect illustration of what God is doing in our life. See, God is refining us. The process is sanctification. God is working out all the impurities that don't reflect his character in us. And it takes time. But don't ever feel just because you're going through the fire that God is not there with you and he's working on you. See, in sanctification, just like that refining fire, it, it burns, it, it's hot, it hurts. But know this, that God's refining fire is worth it, that God knows exactly what you can handle, and that God wants to empower you through the process of sanctification. Again, this is not you doing personal development, trying to figure it on your own. No, it's a cooperative process of your obedience followed by God's faithfulness. See, I'm confident in this, that he who began a good work in you will finish it. God is going to walk you through the entire process of sanctification until your day comes. And that is whether the Lord comes back or you move on to heaven. And so sanctification, yeah, it's a lifelong journey. It's going to be your entire life as a Christian. But know this, it's not about achieving perfection today, but about every day choosing to yield to God's grace and his plan for your life. And so my challenge for every young adult today would be this. Embrace God's transforming work in your life. Cooperate with the Spirit of God and strive to reflect Christ more clearly to a world that desperately needs to see Him. Let, him, let them see Him in you. Would you pray with me? God, I thank you so much, Lord. I thank you for every young adult under the sound of my voice. I pray now, Lord, that as they look upon their life, that they would see your faithfulness, God that they would see that it's you that's working in and through them. Lord, that as they, they walk, they would feel the prompting of the Holy Spirit telling them to do what's right. And God, that they would understand that you always bless obedience. And Lord, that obedience to you is the best way that we can shine godly character to others. I pray, Lord, that in conversations and decisions, God, that we wouldn't look at them as finite moments, but that we would realize that every decision, every conversation, it's a moment for us to point to an eternal glory. And really that our words and our actions matter, God. That as we reflect Christ, there are people who will come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ because of our faithfulness to you. But God, we know that we don't hold the responsibility to save people and we don't hold the responsibility to change ourselves. But God, we, we are called to obey and to trust you and the work that you're doing. And so help us to live by the Spirit, the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in us. God, help us every day to, to follow you and to walk in step with you. And God, if there's people here today that are feeling, uh, Lord, ashamed that they haven't obeyed you to the full measure that they should, God, I pray that you would remind them that that too is a lesson. And God, that you are sanctifying them. And that tomorrow is a new day for them to walk in obedience to you. God, we thank you that you're full of grace, you're full of love, and you're full of mercy for us. And that your mercies are new every morning. Help us to be made into the image of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, God bless you, young adults. We love you and we'll see you soon.